I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevning. Welcome to Creek Devil. Welcome to Campfire Talk, everyone. This is where we sit around the fire, put our feet up with a cold drink, and let the conversation flow. Um, I should have started this a little bit sooner because David wanted to uh, wanted to ask for us about our updates. And uh, what what was it you said, Tracy? <laughs> He was out playing around on his damn lawnmower and, you know. <laughs> he, he didn't want to join us, see? Yeah, he, too busy. I bet there was a beer on that lawnmower, too. <laughs> well, hell, if there was a beer in that lawnmower, I think I'd have been there, too. <laughs> right. Hey, hell, hey, that's how I cut grass. So. <laughs> <laughs> it may not be straight rows, but it gets cut. <laughs> there you go. You know, I, I think my yard's getting bigger. It used to take me a six pack to do my yard. Now it takes about eight. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how that happens, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's a strange co- I mean, I can't figure it out. <laughs> I asked my wife about it. She just rolled her eyes and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't. She didn't see the yard bigger. No, she actually said, "I think it's smaller." Tracy, I said, "Really?" <laughs> <laughs> did, did she ask you how many times you had to cut it in one day? Yeah, she did. Actually, <laughs> 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 she actually stopped me the other day and said, "How many times are you gonna go along that same strip right there?" I said, "What?" She said, you've already cut it three times. I was, oh, I sorry about that. <laughs> we're, we're she said, yeah, quit wasting go- gas. <laughs> we're wearing them beer goggles where you're uh, cutting the grass. I, I kind of, well, well, what I was, I was thinking about, you know, NASCAR and, you know, going in circles, you know, just. Oh. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> I didn't like when the circle got smaller. So I just started swinging to the, to the, to the wall, you know. <laughs> I see, I see. <laughs> <laughs> well, Forrest, I don't, I don't know how, what kind of how much of the updates you want to tell David about. Well, you know what? I, I thought of something um, last night. I was sitting here actually. I was watching Fred on on the TV, and um, <laughs> I don't know why I thought of it, but you, I I don't know if I I know you probably remember um, that one thing I failed to mention to you was when we were out looking, we couldn't find Dosi and um, my cat, one of my cats. And I don't like to leave her outside because she's a mostly white cat. And um, uh, I had actually walked up to the road and I was walking up and down the road calling her thinking, could she possibly have been so silly as to go across the the, uh, farm to market road here? And these idiots out here, um, I'll drive 100 miles an hour down it. And um, so I was like, out there with my spotlight going up and down the road and I'd walk down to one corner and then uh, turned around and walked back to my other corner and I was covering a good piece of property and I called and called and called, never heard her. And I was walking back and (laughs) all of a sudden I hear this whoop from across the road and I stopped (laughs) and I looked over there and I actually uh, scanned my uh spotlight out there and there was deer out in the pasture and they were all looking towards the woods i mean they're all their heads were up and they were all looking towards the woods they heard it too <clears throat> and i was like okay i think it's time for me to go in Dosi, you're on your own and by the time i got here's the funny part by the time i got walked back down to the house she was sitting on the back porch so <laughs> Of course, she probably been sitting there the whole time watching me walking up and down the highway. Like, of course. <laughs> did she did but, she give you that dumb look? Like, hey, what do you think you're doing? You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been right here, mom. What are, you silly woman, you. <laughs> but <clears throat> anyway, but uh, yeah, uh, David, I we had a uh, you know I don't know how. Uh, it was over at your place, but uh, we, we had totality here in Central Texas um, on the 
April the 8th when we had the eclipse. And um, I'd only seen totality once before when we were up in Alaska. <clears throat> of course, that's been quite a few years ago. But uh, um, we decided we were going to have a barbecue. And several people from work came over. And then um, we had it all spread out in the backyard and uh, had lawn chairs and everything pulled up. And uh, it, we were having just a good old time, and nobody was drinking any alcohol. There was no alcohol allowed. It was just strictly Dr. Pepper and iced tea. And um, so, oh, excuse me, we had Coke too. And um, but anyway, um, we were all sitting there, and we had gone out, and we uh, stood in the middle of the driveway because we were underneath a big oak tree. So <laughs> during the totality, went out, went out, and stayed in the uh, stood in the middle of the driveway. And uh, ood and odd and, you know, and all that sort of stuff over it. And uh, came back and we sat back down. And it must have been about a half an hour after the eclipse when um, all of a sudden the horses. And, oh, by the way, we'd opened the gate coming into the, the yard. <clears throat> and um, I have like a seven foot fence uh, around my yard. and. Um, so the horses all came running up to the the pasture gate. We'd let them out that day in the front pasture, and they all came up to the back pasture gate, and uh, they were standing there. Now, the stallion we'd left in because we'd actually let him out earlier, but he was kind of being a pill and was running running them around and trying to herd them through the pasture and wouldn't let it. they get to eating, and then he'd want to herd them again. So... We went out there and got him and put him back in the pasture by himself, which he wasn't real happy about. But, you know, it was what it was. So um, they all come running up to, to the gate and they were like having a meet and greet at the, the gate like they hadn't seen each other in, you know, five hours. <laughs> oh, my. And um, so and then it was like. Uh, they must have had an epiphany. They all came in the gate that we left open into the yard and when they came around to the back i and we all well i realized and so did jessica that what they were coming in for was the water because i have a hog trough back there that i keep uh limestone bricks around and it's kept full of fresh water all the time and it's actually for the cats and they can step up on those limestone uh bricks and uh just stand there and get their water in fact, I even have a couple of them down inside the tank so that if the water gets low, uh, they can step and stand on those and get their water. Well, the horses remembered that that was back there. And what they really had gone to the back gate for was they wanted to go to the water tank. They were thirsty. So um, <coughs> they all came to the backyard. And we were kind of standing there looking at the, the horses and stuff. And. I was actually, <clears throat> my chair was angled such that I was facing west towards the end of the, the mobile home here. And Jessica was sideways to it. And, um, and then Angela was facing the same direction as me. And uh, the other guys were actually facing south, their chairs and stuff. So they were kind of, they were facing towards me and I was I don't know why we just arranged our chairs that way. And I had kind of turned my chair a little bit more when the horses came in and I was just look, sitting there looking at them. And all of a sudden I went, well, where's the ba baby going? And I mean, that's about all I got out. Where's the baby going? And then I realized what I was looking at wasn't the baby. Um, because <laughs> this about a five foot tall uh, juvenile had jumped up and I was like, what the hell? What was that? And I mean, you know, I, you always say that. And I think I reminded you, Will, you know, and why do we always say that? Because you know damn well what it is. Right. And um, <laughs> and uh, Jessica was like, what the heck? And then Angela saw it, too. And she says, what the hell was that? And she said, did I just see what I thought I saw? And I mean, and I went, yeah. And it literally ran around the, the west end of the, the mobile home 
And <clears throat> her son looked at his mom and he was like, what, 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 what? And I said, well, it went that away. And of course he ran to the front. It was gone. It had already gone over the fence in the front and was gone. And, um, I think, I don't remember which one of y'all asked me what color it was, but it actually was about the color of this, my, my weanling colt is a, he's a, he's actually a blood bay, but he was, had this kind of a, a dark brown, um, light brown baby fuzz still on him. And he was only kind of getting, it was, he was blowing it, but that's what he, what he had on his back. And that's why, I mean, this was the same color as that. It was a dark brown with lighter brown, uh, almost a, a buckskin color on the, the shoulders and then down the arm. And all I could see was the right arm when they went around, when he, when he went around, she went around, whatever it was, it went around the corner of the house, that one right arm swinging up and, uh, I really couldn't see the legs all that well because at that point in time, the grass over there on that side of the house was pretty high because David won't bring his lawnmower down here and mow my grass. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Tracy, there's an opportunity. There you go. <laughs> you can drink a I'm lot a, of beer. I'm going I'm I'm to give, give him a break on this one. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, I mean, we just all sit there with our mouths open, and and Angela just kept going. I can't believe! I can't believe! I just saw one, <laughs> and uh, you know, it was just. I mean, I don't know why it is. It's like you every time you see one, you're still amazed. I mean, it's almost kind of like the first time you see one. I don't know why. Why is that? <laughs> you know. Miss so. Forrest, I got a, I got a question for you. You were talking about his color. Now, uh-huh. I grew up down here in the South. I've got naturally, well, when I was younger, I had naturally dark brown hair. But if I, when I was outside in the summer, my hair would get almost blonde until I had got a haircut and it'd be dark brown again. Do you think the sun bleaching of, of the hair may be? Yeah, that was, was, what it that, was sun bleached. Yeah, I think the base color was dark brown, and I think it was just sun bleached because of what I could tell, it was like across the shoulders and <clears throat> on the top of the arms and it seemed to be on the top of the head. And now I was th- actually thinking about this too, Will, because I had never really, uh, you know, it's kind of like I keep going over it in my mind's eye. I don't remember it being a, um, a large like gorilla type head, you know, a skull like that with a large sagittal crisp. And I think that it was, it probably, I think they develop very similar to gorillas. You know, when the babies are born, they don't have, they don't exhibit that uh, sagittal crest. But as they, uh, the older they get, the males get develop those. And um, uh, the females do as well, but not to the extent that the males do. Um, but at I approximately didn't what, what I age do they start that. showing that? that sagittal crest at about what age do they start showing that well it starts developing in the late uh uh early two years two years of age late yearling age oh that that early i I thought it would have been more like you know in their teens no uh well they develop faster than we do but uh i mean they start getting it a little bit i'm not saying that all of a sudden they just have it you know but uh it's it's it develops more the older they get so um and i don't know what uh, prompts the prompts that whether it's the testosterone i can't even say it um in the body or or what prompts that development but it's just like uh you know a male infant child is not going to be in humans is not going to be that much different in other words it'd be real hard to tell the sex that's why you hear you watch a lot of these true crime shows well we didn't know if it was male or female when they're looking at children because they don't develop a lot of these uh very distinctive male female traits in their bone structure 
until, uh, you know, later years. And because we're slower at developing, yeah, it doesn't usually show up until our teenage years. And, uh, you know, the older they get, when the, the males and gorillas and such, when they are teenagers, they start to show those uh, features. So, but they do when you can even look at some of the uh, uh, babies in the uh, zoos and stuff, they start to develop some of that in their late yearling to uh, two year old years. Forced when it took off around the trailer, was it on all fours or on two oh, feet? It was on two feet. It okay. was on two feet. And the only thing we could figure was that it came out of that grove of trees. I have a grove of trees, and I really probably should take a picture of it for you in the backyard. <clears throat> and um, um, send me one of those. I'd like to see that. Yeah, yeah. I, it, I think it was. I think I think it was sitting there, crouched in there the whole time. And then later, when we went around to the uh, the side of the kennel, um, I was walking around back there and. Um, Jessica and I saw there were places that you could tell something had been laying down in the, the tall grass back there along the back side of the of that grove. And it could have been laying up there in that tall grass and we, we wouldn't have seen it either. So, and, I, and yeah, this is in my yard. I have tall grass because I haven't had anybody out here to help me mow it. And uh, David. Uh, <laughs> 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 but my yard is quite large, so, you know, and, uh, uh, unfortunately my lawnmower pooped out, so I need to buy a new riding lawnmower. So anywho. David, just bring yours down there, buddy. <laughs> I'll drive it down there. I'll buy the gas for you. <laughs> Forrest, did y'all find any tracks after that by chance? No, because that's, and that's it was all grassy over there and gravel on that okay. end. Okay. Now, Miss Forrest, you might you might have already said, but about how far away was it from you when you first saw it? Hmm. I'm gonna say probably thirty feet, thirty five feet. Holy that's crap. Close. It wasn't far at all. Hmm. And how many people saw it? Three. Three of us did. That's pretty good. Yeah, just what do you think him. made it ran? Do you think it ran because he, he realized that you guys were looking at him or No, I don't well, I don't think he realized we weren't looking at him before that or her or whatever it was. Uh I think what spooked it was the horses coming up uh, all up in the backyard like they did. You know what it was? You guys were barbecuing and didn't have any beer. <laughs> That's what it was. Right. Dang. That'll do it. Uh, mooch some beer off of us and mom and dad wouldn't know. I'd be mooching beer if I was there, so come on now. You know, you need to make them... Give the need, fellow need a little bit them, of credit. Now. Need, need to make those uh, juvenile Bigfoot earn their keep. You know, if you bring some beer, make them mow the lawn. Right. Uh, okay, maybe I could try them to sit on a lawnmower. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. That's a good I'm idea right there. It was it was Mike Smith up in East Texas that had problems with uh uh the remember Mike talking about he was yeah. mowing his lawn. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they were watching him mow the lawn. See if he'd had I heard a similar right story there. down here about that. About a guy that was mowing his lawn and his, his yard bordered like woods. And and he saw one actually squatted down about 20 feet away from him, just watching him. And uh, when the thing realized, he's he's because he stopped the lawnmower. And when the thing realized he seen him, he took off running. Uh, I haven't been able to talk to that guy, but that, that's a story that was told to me not too long ago. And I believe it happened this year. I wouldn't be surprised. Well, I think yeah. they find us a source of entertainment, and God only knows how long it had probably been sitting there. And I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me that it didn't smell the barbecue and the food. I mean, uh, that would only be natural. I mean, animals coming up smelling the, because uh, I know our, even after we cleared all the tables and stuff, we still left the tables sitting out there. And uh, the, uh, I got up the next morning, and there was two raccoons sitting out there. And I'm sure oh, yeah. they just smelled all the food out there, and they were like, 
okay, well, where's where's the food, Mom? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that would absolutely attract him. He may have been hoping y'all would clear out and leave some behind and he could grab some. Well, if he'd have been real smart while we were out there looking at the uh, up at the uh, eclipse would have been the, the time to do it because we were all out in the driveway <clears throat> in a clearer area so we could look up the sun. So, uh, you know, with all of our little <laughs> glasses on. So, um, hell, was, I it even get... was it a complete eclipse? Was it a complete eclipse there in Texas? Yes, it was. Uh -huh. It was a to it, total it, eclipse there. It just got kind of dim here. I mean, it, it like late evening looking, but it was really strange because everything seemed to have a red color to it. Well, you could. Yeah. Have, it was so total here that you could actually see uh, the sun flares coming off of it, the red flares coming off of the side. Oh, and wow. you could, once, once the totality hit, you could look at it with your bare eye and see those. It was really neat looking. We got, uh, I think, didn't I send you a picture of it, Will? That, uh, that you might have, yeah. Yeah, I think I did. And it, I mean, it's, uh, there's, and then one of the pictures, you can actually see a sun flare coming off the bottom of it. And uh, uh, we were all like, what is that? What is that? What's that red stuff coming off of there? <laughs> and then uh, Jessica, being her, you know, tech, Techno self, she looked it up on the uh, internet while we were all looking, and she said, "Those are sun flares." <laughs> so, if if you still got that picture for us, uh, shoot it to him. I'd like to see that. I'll, I'll, oh yeah, I'll send it to you. I still got it. I would, I would too, Miss yeah. Morris. I'd like to see that. I think okay. it got to about eighty percent totality around here for uh, me and Tracy, didn't it, Tracy? Uh, somewhere around that, yeah. I mean, I, it got real dark like it was late evening, but it was strange because everything looked like it had a red color to it. I mean, the leaves on the trees, they didn't look green. They looked like they were orange or, you know, a, a reddish color. And it didn't last long. It was maybe 15 minutes, and the sun started, you know, brightening back up. Yeah, that's how it was here. Everything had a reddish tinge to it. Well, the, yeah, the... The actual eclipse doesn't last a whole whole. I mean, it's not like an hour or so, but uh, it 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 went dark here, and uh, they they said there was probably a, a million and a half people that came to this part of the country to come see it. <clears throat> now I remember several years ago. Well, it's probably been about ten or twelve years ago. We had a we had a total eclipse here, and. Uh, it, it, I mean, it got so dark, the yard lights came on, you know, the outdoor lights came on and everything. But then yeah, all of a sudden, I, everything brightened back up, and it was a hot day again. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what that's what ours did, too. All the all the uh, pole lights came on. All the booger lights came on. And, uh, <laughs> all the booger lights. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> yeah, the cicadas started, and it was like, oh, <laughs> they thought it was nighttime. But. It was do things, a surprise. Do things, do things like that tend to affect primates? I mean, does it make them, as far as you know, act different? Because, I mean, I know I, I have deer no and coyote do. I have no idea. I really don't. Um, I mean, I noticed that the birds quit uh, singing and all that sort of stuff, but I mean, as soon as the sun came back out, they were all just like nothing had ever happened. So uh, I'm sure that they probably realized that something weird just happened, but they don't. I don't think they have a, a realization of what actually did happen. So I guess it'd be more no different than a very, very dark cloud passing across the, you know, sun. Yeah, it probably wouldn't have much effect on them. Because I always wondered, you know, people actually come to Austin to watch the bats come out from the Congress Avenue Bridge. I don't know if you guys have ever heard about that, but uh, we have a large uh, Mexican bat population that congregate underneath the Congress Avenue Bridge, which is the main road coming up to the the Capitol building. And... Um, so they come out in the evenings and people actually, tourists come here just to watch the bats come out. And 
the one thing, you know, I never checked on was to see if the bats were coming out. Hmm. I guess I should check on that. That would be kind of interesting to note. Yeah. That'd be kind of disconcerting. Them come out and start flying and then go, oops, we got to go back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, something we kind of looked at, I don't we haven't talked about yet, really, Forrest, you know those articles, and that's that's like the third or fourth one I've seen in the past couple of years about, you know, where they've discovered that Homo sapiens almost died out at one oh, point. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I don't. Uh, I don't think I sent you you guys the article, the latest one. Talk about the one what? that said there was only like twelve hundred and eighty left at one point. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. 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 And it wasn't just, I mean, we had a variety of uh, hominin species out there. It wasn't just, you know, uh, one or two. I mean, we had a variety. And, and, and I think they're going to probably find, probably when we're all, all of us guys are dead and gone, they'll probably find out that there's even more. Um, but the interesting fact is it. Uh, it was about 700,000, wasn't it about 700,000 uh, years ago? And then I believe uh, so, yeah. And then <clears throat> again, um, I think it was 40,000 years ago. And it has almost always been attributed to that one volcano. What is it, Tobo or is it or Tobu or the one out in the, uh, in the Indonesian uh, mm. islands out there? Krakatoa? And, uh, no, not Krakatoa. Uh, it's another one they got out there. Oh. And, um, I mean, it actually, uh, the island of Flores and uh, a bunch of those, that chain of that, uh, there's an archip- uh, archipelago, a string of islands out there that all once upon a time were uh, connected, but they had, when this, uh, one time this volcano blew, it just, uh, um, it's one of those super volcanoes. Oh, I know the one you're talking about. I can't remember the name of it, though. But, yeah, I've I've read about that before. And um, it has uh, nearly brought about about the decimation of uh, humankind. It created like a nuclear winter for several years. Yeah. Because all the ash into the atmosphere and everything. Yeah, we weren't the only species that were affected. But... uh, you know, we've had five or six total uh, destruction of uh, the species of animals on the, the planet. And I would imagine, you know, it, it it won't be the last time it will happen. You I know? have to wonder, you know, like yeah. Danny, with Danny Vendramini's book, Them and Us, you know, how yes. much predation played a part of that, too. You know, I mean, if there was a nuclear winter, uh, some of the, you know, the larger predators... We're going to eat anything, especially if other foods might not have been available. Been available, and uh, you know we do know these things do eat people. Yeah. Well, and there, I mean, there are evidences of cannibalism in humans, and have been for uh, eons of time. I mean, we're not immune to that, and um, there have been incidences of uh, cannibalism shown in uh, Neanderthals, and uh, so. I mean, when yeah, uh, Benjamin he talked a lot about that in that book, he he talked about how um, Neanderthals and humans conflicted, and that Neanderthal would kidnap Homo sapien females and have their way with them. That's why people have Neanderthal DNA in them now. Well, you know now. Guys, you know how I am very sympathetic towards the Neanderthals. Um, why are we? Why do we always assume that the Neanderthals kidnapped human women? They were human too. I don't. You know, I don't know why I even said that. Um, why would we assume almost, almost they were out them. there? They were out there. Well, it was Cro-Magnon man at the time uh, that they were out there kidnapping. Uh, Denisovans and uh, uh, Cro-Magnon women to rape and pillage and have their way with. How do we know that the big uh, that uh, I started to say Bigfoot? Excuse me. Uh, that Neanderthals were doing that. 
Uh, he, he doesn't. Think, he I doesn't. Think. He doesn't ascribe that only to Neanderthals. That the the human creatures did the same, and that's what wiped out the Neanderthals. Well, and that's what that's what Benjamini says in his book. I think there were a lot of factors that uh, contributed to the demise of the Neanderthals, other than just uh, uh, warfare between the groups. But uh, I think um, climate change had more to do with it than anything else. Well. That's just what I was going to say is I think climate change had a lot to do with it. Uh, you know, the decimation of your uh, large herbivores at that time, which was their uh, source of uh, uh, their diet. And uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of things that attribute to. And, of course, I've always said that I think that uh, there are Neanderthals that still exist. And I think that uh, these sightings that they have in the Ural Mountains and in the Carpathians Mountains, I think those are excellent places for Neanderthals to to have gone to and to have hidden. Well, and, Ms. Forrest, uh, let me ask you a I question would love on to that. Think that they were still here. <clears throat> let, let me ask you a question on that. that. Now, growing up and all my life until I, I saw uh, Vendramini's book, I always thought of Neanderthals as looking a lot like us, you know, pretty much hairless with, you know, large skulls, large brow ridges, you know, much more muscular and, and stockier than us. And his book, they're hair covered. Mm-hmm. And and that drawing, that, that picture that he had in the first article I read, that it scared the crap out of me because it was so close to what I looked at that night um do you think they were hairless like us or do you think they were hair covered like um like the monsters in the woods i think that they were hairless and it's pretty much been proven that they were i don't know where he ever got that idea i've never read that book i never well (laughs) what he gets what he gets that from though what he gets that from and i i understand his point is you know when when they have nobody knows what fossil species looked like other than you know what they can put muscle musculature and things like that on they don't really know what the finished product looked like yeah they do a uh, lot of guessing when they do that they, they give it artists do it and when they did neanderthals hairless like us that was those were artist concepts they don't really know i mean so he had a valid point they could have looked like that well Here's where I'm going to interject into this conversation that we also have a complete genome of uh, the DNA of Neanderthals now. And there is no indication whatsoever. And I'm not a DNA expert. I don't know where to look at, look for uh, hair covering and such, but it does exist out there on the, the DNA strand. And uh, there have been experts in the field, far greater minds than I would ever hope to have, that have that will sit here and tell you that they were not hairless creatures. Uh, they were uh, they were hairless creatures. They weren't uh, hairy like uh, what is portrayed in that book. I have never read that book. Um, have no interest in reading that book because it really does not. Um, I, I don't. I don't. I don't put any credence to that, guys. I'm sorry. Now, this is where we're going to disagree. But um, I think that you could uh, you could shave a Neanderthal, comb his hair, put a suit on him, and he wouldn't look. He could walk down New York City Avenue anywhere in any big city, and he he might get some glasses, but nobody's going to turn around and go, "Oh my God, what was that that went by?" Uh, <laughs> because I don't think I don't think it happened. I'm sorry. Um, there are yes there's uh who's the russian um wrestler that's uh you know who i'm talking about well he's actually a mayor of a town um in russia and i mean this guy is like got a genius intellect but you turn him sideways he looks like a freaking neanderthal you know exactly who I'm i know who about. you're talking about but yeah, this guy's like seven foot tall name. he's big well, yeah, yeah, he's, he's like, seven, like seven foot tall, and, and from but, everything I've read, most Neanderthals were less than six feet tall, but they well, were very they were. broad well, that, and very that muscular. Mean, that doesn't mean then they were very muscular. Yes, uh, 
and they were stockily built, but that doesn't mean that he might not have a whole lot of Neanderthal in him. And you would expect that, uh, I would think, in uh, people that uh, are in the northern climes, but that when they've done the DNA testing on a lot of these people in Europe, northern Europe and such, they don't really have a whole lot of uh, Neanderthal DNA in them. Actually, <laughs> you're Asians and you're... Um, if you really want to know what a Neanderthal probably really looked like, I would say look at your Austro- Australian uh, Aborigines because they have the highest percentage of uh, Neanderthal DNA in them. The thing the average percentage of Neanderthal DNA in people is like 2% or something like that? It's anywhere from 3 to 5%. Okay, yeah. And you'll find that they're, they've, they've since done a lot of testing through Melanesia and Indonesia, and there's like a string, like they a band that has run through uh, areas of Indonesia down into uh, Australia, like they followed a, a, a corridor in there. It's at, you know, all of those islands used to be connected at one point in time. And um, so I think that... Uh, uh, Neanderthals did a lot of wandering. I mean, we found Neanderthals in uh, the Middle East. Uh, they didn't go too far south, but they seem to have gone uh, east and then down into, uh, or at least some of them, because that one Denisovan uh, uh, finger that was found that was fir- first started the uh, people to realize that there was another type of uh, human out there. Um, and it was a female. They were able to uh, find out that she was a female, and she was not only Denisovan, but she was also half Neanderthal. So obviously, Neanderthal was getting around. I'd always heard they were nomadic. So, and they had culture. I mean, they had they made clothes. Uh, we are finding more out about them every day. So, I mean, it's not like this was just a brutish band of guys that ran around with a club in one hand, you know, raping and pillaging women and uh, dragging them around by the hair like you see in some of the old movies, you know, dragging the women into their cave. And and uh, you can only imagine what transpired in there. But uh, I, I just don't think that they uh, were those type of uh, creatures. I saw a documentary a while back about them and they had recently found a grave and Inside the grave, they had found flowers and other things where they were mourning the death of that person. Yeah, uh, the body had actually been rubbed with uh, red ochre, and yeah. um, uh, which would account for them wanting it to look more lifelike. Because truthfully speaking, when you die, you start turning kind of grayish colored. <clears throat> and um, so that's why they put makeup on people when they, you know have open caskets um and that was their attempt at trying to make that individual look still alive and i mean if you're putting flowers on a body you have to realize that somebody was mourning that individual right and so you're not looking at uh i mean they obviously had emotions and feelings similar to our own so uh, why would they be any different than us other than they looked a little differently? That's all that I see. Yeah. I don't know, Miss Boris. I just, I, I mean, what Benjamin said, I mean, he pointed out facts to everything. And, and, and in fact, when uh, Neanderthal were most populous, they believed that it was a, a cold weather earth. Uh, and most of them, most of the remains of Neanderthals have been found in Europe in, yes. in climates that, that are today still, still pretty much a cold climate. They're not, they don't have summers like we have down here, you know, and, but he made a lot of good points and he did not say that they were like roving bands, just roving, running around, you know, raping and pillaging. What he said was that homo sapiens, the, the predecessors of Homo sapiens exterminated them, and so it was a constant state of war. Just like in the American Southwest, 
you know, between different tribes of, of Native Americans. At that time, it was a constant state of war. You take a prisoner, they made a slave, you know, or you killed him. And 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 that's what he's saying in 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 what I read. And and I could see how it would make sense. And he 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 believes they were hair covered because of the climate. From, well, I guess from he where they came. He wanted to, but why would they be wearing clothes if they they made clothes for themselves? Uh, and uh, we found sewing implements in the, uh, uh, the fossil finds. So why would they be making clothes if they were such hairy creatures? I mean, and I would those clothes, would those clothes and sewing implements necessarily have belonged to them? Could it not have been from some captives that they caught? No. You see, no. There, there's a there's a back question to every question on this, and well, only science is going to be able to figure out what is what, and. I'm hoping that maybe someday they'll be able to figure out what dinosaurs look like, what they actually yeah. look like. Well, let me um, let me but, put my two cents in here, guys. I think I think Ventramini has an interesting book, but I think you need to replace Neanderthal with our creatures. You have to understand. I kind of, I kind of agree with you. Neanderthals existed on this earth longer than any Homo sapiens sapiens have. Thirty thousand years, isn't it? No, it's been longer than that. Longer than that? And, uh, so they were around a long time before, uh, you know, we and developed into what we are now. And um, what killed they them had all? Culture. They had culture. What killed them all? I don't know. Uh, and any more than he knows. Uh, he can't, I'm not he saying can't he's the expert on anything. Know. There is absolutely no evidence for your for uh, what's his name Bendernagel uh, to to Bendermine. assume ben, whatever it is <laughs> Bendernagel. I haven't read his book, so I have to plead ignorant on what is said in the book. But just going by what you told me, there is absolutely no evidence out there, none whatsoever, of them uh, battling. Uh, you know. Homo sapiens or Cro Magnon man at that point in time. I'm not saying that it didn't happen because I'm sure it did. But, you know, to make a, such a large scale battle um, that it would completely destroy an entire species of man, I think that's just a bit of a stretch there. I yeah, think he's that making it, it sound is, like he's making it sound like genocide or something. Well, that's kind of what the what the drift that I'm getting. But what I would think no, 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 no. anything involved is that some other species of human, like Romanian man, may have introduced diseases that maybe uh, big these Neanderthals weren't uh, immune to. Just like we introduced uh, smallpox, measles, and uh, these other diseases that actually killed a huge proportion of uh native americans that were here okay so um, here's let's let's step step aside with the end of a minute okay because we yeah. don't really know any of that it is possible it's something like the sasquatch um i mean it could they could have through predation could have reduced the other hominid numbers i think I mean, I he used neanderthal but i think he was off on that one it's not neanderthal but he didn't recognize, and he, he won't recognize. I've contacted the guy, and he won't uh, consider any other hominid. But it is possible because these things do, and there's other. And I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna put a book together on it. What I think, um, and there's too much to go into that here. But that's kind of my thinking. Kind of like the Minnesota Ice Man species. Well, no, the Ice Man is something different altogether. Okay. That's one of these other relic hominids. Could be a Neanderthal, or not a Neanderthal because it's a different continent, but it's something similar. Well, what I, one, one thing I've thought about since I read what he wrote, um, he said they were hair covered because of the climate. Okay. Well, all the reports I hear down here in the South, where right now it's 94 degrees, they're still hair covered. Uh, right. Wouldn't they be hairless? I mean, wouldn't they be much more like us instead of having? Okay. You're talking about the, talking the Sasquatches. About You're yeah, talking yeah. about Bigfoot versus uh, Neanderthals. Uh, I'm comparing 
what he we says. We don't even know, in all honesty, we do not even know if the original human ancestors like Australopithecus, uh, Homo noetae, Homo uh, erectus, any of those, we don't know how hair covered they were. We, uh, like Australopithecus, we assume had a, a larger amount of hair covering its body because they were just a step above <clears throat> having uh, come out of the uh, species divide there that divided apes and man, whatever caused that a mutation that made them the way they are and apes to go another route. Uh, we don't even know how hairy those guys are. I mean, they could have been naked as a jaybird for as, uh, as far as we know. We don't know. I, I agree. I agree. And, and that's, 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 that's not what, that's not no what I was trying information. to say. I'm, I'm just asking, you know, if climate has so much of an effect on hair or lack of hair, and they're very similar to us. Why are they still hair covered? All the reports I've I've heard a report of one that looked like he had the mange, you know, and patches of hair missing, but was still hair covered. Well, look at your uh, and uh, chimpanzees uh, and uh, gibbons. They all and most monkey species live in tropical areas and i don't know of any of them that are hair covered there you go there you go that's that's my question are well, they more human areas. are they are, are they more yeah. ape i mean that, go ahead miss far well, i was gonna say you're assuming that uh, neanderthal would have been hair covered because it lived in a colder climate but look at all these other species of primates that all are hair covered i haven't seen any of them naked the closest thing to being naked <clears throat> is your stump telling the cack when they're first born? They look they look like little naked babies. And uh, that's, here, see, you're making my you point know, for me. That's what I'm talking about. Are they more thinking. human, or are they more ape? Because apes are hair covered, and they live in climates much hotter than where I live. Are you talking about Neanderthals? No, I'm talking about apes. I'm talking about our Sasquatch. More Sasquatch, ape or more human? Sasquatch, I have always said, I think is a a, a great ape. I've never differed on that opinion. That that that's what I was trying to get to. I mean, they 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 can't be a human because humans um, have evolved to be hairless, pretty much from the climate that we live in and our DNA. But they're hair covered and they live in the same climate we do. You know, so what percentage would you say of their DNA? is com comparable to human DNA. Oh, I have no idea. I would say there would probably be, um, it'd be hard to uh, even determine what their, you know, chimpanzees, there are scientists that say they share 96% of our DNA, and there's some that goes far as to say they're 98 to 99% of shared DNA with humans. Um, the question is, what is that DNA that we share between them? Because there's even differences in specific uh, DNA segments that there'll be percentage differences. I mean, my God, you could, you can, I was actually reading an article on this last night uh, on the, the Y chromosome that is being affected in all males, including humans um, and the great apes. And even showing up in some other primates that they're having, you know, women all are XX, men are XY. Um, that Y chromosome is having a, show, exhibiting a lot of mutations and uh, it is, is exhibiting a lot of rapid mutating in all of these uh, eight species, including man. And they don't even know why, but they were discussing the fact that in DNA, and I am by no means any DNA expert, but you can get percentages. There are certain percentages that your bonobos, which are basically pygmy chimpanzees, they share more DNA with us in these certain segments of their chromosomes, where more so than even your pantropodite, which is your common chimp. But yet the common chimp 
overall shares more DNA with us than the bonobos do. Wrap your mind around that one. Um, Because I was just like going, I think I'm going to have to read this article three or four times to really comprehend what they're trying to tell me here. Um, Will, Will, why don't you try to get a DNA expert on here to talk to us about this? Because this, I've got a lot of questions about that, too. And I think it would be really interesting to have a DNA expert, someone who actually deals with and works with it on a daily basis to try to help explain some of this to us. Well, Tom and I have been looking for one, and we haven't been able to find one yet. So if anybody out there knows a DNA expert that will come on and explain DNA to us, we'd appreciate that. I know I would, because, I mean, I've, I've got, like Ms. Farr said, Jim sharing so much commonality with our DNA, but they are so different from us. Are they? You know, well, are they really? my, my, my arms aren't that long. I'm not that strong. Well, they um, are. You would, you would. They're not that mistake, tall. You would not mistake a chimp for a human. No, well, no. That's, that's what. That's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's but not you know, I was trying but, to make it all. <laughs> but they, they are so different from us, and that tiny fraction of DNA that is not in common with us makes them what they are. And, and I, I, I have a lot of questions about that because I just don't get it. If they're so common, why don't they look more like us? You know, why, why aren't they proportioned like us? I mean, even if they still had hair, why aren't they proportioned like us? And maybe Sasquatch, the monsters in the woods, are, are a, kind of a bridge between us and chimpanzees. They're proportion more like us even though not exact but they still i mean y'all get you guys get what i'm saying yeah well i i get what you're saying but uh i think that and then and i've said this all along and i may be right i may be right i may be wrong i don't know i'm always i've always thrown this out there guys and you know i've always said if somebody proves me wrong i'll be the first one to say hey i was wrong but i think uh the bigfoot developed on uh by way of convergent evolution um and um that's can, can you why. explain that term convergent evolution because i don't well, that's what I mean you, you have two uh, it can be common species it can be uncommon species that develop along a, a path that they end up having uh traits that are very okay. similar and common to each other Okay, um, I get you. I, I, I get what you're talking about now. Okay, I'm sorry. I just misunderstood that term. I didn't. I didn't. Yeah, I well, never heard it the, really. The thing that they're uh, they're finding in the fossil finds today is that there are um, primates, fossil primates, and we're not talking about necessarily um, ancestors to man, but they they think that there is one out there that. Uh, <clears throat> that they have found here in the, the last 10 years and they're still studying it and uh, um, they haven't made any decisions, but they have shown signs of bipedalism. And so I think bipedalism may have developed a lot earlier than what we might have thought. And these, they also exhibited a great deal of arboreal-ism. So they were actually living in the trees and they think that bipedalism in some of these apes may have developed due to the fact that they would walk along the limbs rather than walking along on the ground. And then that's how they developed, uh, finally decided that, hey, I can do this in a tree. I can get down on the ground and walk. And that's how they think it may have developed. It's kind of like uh, like, uh, orangutans are real famous for, uh, they very rarely come to the ground. They spend most of their time in trees, and they have a unique way of walking across the 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 tree limbs and such so um they think that maybe that might have been the uh stimulus to uh some of this bipedalism but you know what it says is that there are different types of um, primates out there that developed bipedalism and so you can have a great ape that just went on to uh walk and they don't even walk like man bigfoot does not walk like a man they walk in a straight line, which is a compliant gait. They don't, uh, they, uh, they don't, we stagger step. 
and we don't walk anything like them. Yeah, they got uh, a gait that no human could ever copy. Well, you know what I always tell everybody is it's, uh, it's like a, a catwalk. And those girls that walk down the catwalk, remember, Will, I called, no, I guess it was Tom that I had called up. And I said, you got to watch this. You got to watch this. Watch the models walking down the catwalk. And the reason they call it a catwalk is because cats walk like that. They walk in their own steps. Literally. And um, <laughs> that's the way they walk. And these women have been trained. God don't ask. Me. I could never walk like that. Oh, my God. <laughs> they literally swing their legs out and walk in a straight line that coming down those catwalks. And I used to do it this far. It's models. hard to do. It, I can't do it. We, we can stay in here <laughs> laughing. laughing <laughs> you used to time. do it, Tracy. <laughs> yeah, I used to do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, my daughters and I, we were at her house one time. We were trying to do it. We were all falling all over each other. But, uh, you know. It's all in how you swing your heel. Like that. That's not natural. <laughs> I, I, I probably shouldn't ask. But, Tracy, I shouldn't ask, but where did you catwalk? <laughs> <laughs> I'll never say. <laughs> That's another whole whole other show there, Will. <laughs> I don't want those. I don't want those pictures becoming public. <laughs> I, I knew it. I shouldn't ask. <laughs> now I get, I get what you're saying as far as about about how they walk. You know, I understand that. I just had to throw a joke in there. You know, it's just me. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, and I know they walk differently, and they even actually step differently because the the mid torso and that what it called a mid torso break in their foot. Yeah. yeah. Is typically a prime primates um, oh, type primates of have it. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. It's a primitive and, that's found in all primates other than man. And, and you know, I was watching the thing about the Patterson Gimlin film. Oh, it's been a year or two ago. I don't even remember what it, who it was that that made the film. They were talking about the way the creature walked. It walked kind of knock kneed like his knees bowed inward every step it took. And that is what they said is typically a, a habit of, of the great apes. When they, when they do walk on, you know, upright, they, they walk knock kneed. And well, there isn't any other primate that walks like Bigfoot. I can guarantee you because you can watch, <clears throat> you can watch macaques, you can watch chimpanzees, you can watch gorillas. There are plenty of them. Plenty of pictures out there on YouTube of them in zoos and even in the the wild, and they don't they don't swing their arms like a human. Bigfoot does do that. Um, they shuffle step and they stagger step. They but when they walk, they shuffle. They don't actually pick up their feet and place their feet like uh, we do. The only time I've ever seen them actually pick up and place their feet. Is when they're doing quadrupedal walking, and when they're on two feet, they don't do that. They shuffle. They're very un uh, unbecoming when they're walking on two feet. They don't walk anything like us. And even you look at some of these macaques that are kept as pets, have been they're trained to walk bipedally. They yeah. they don't even swing their arms. They just kind of keep their arms in front of a front of them, and uh, almost like using them as balancing mechanisms. But they don't, you know, we don't need to do that because our bodies are proportionate, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I get what you're saying. They, they kind of walk like a paratrooper with full gear on. You, you know, you don't you don't walk normal, you know, with that crap on. And, you know, that's how I, every ape I've ever seen at the zoo and in movies, that's how they walk. But I just wonder how far away do you think, let's say, uh, Silverback gorilla. How far away evolution, evolutional wise, evolutional wise, is that a word? Even I mean, how far away do you think they would be from being able to walk bipedally? Well, they can get up and walk, but they don't. But I mean, like... doing it, doing it naturally, like we do. Like I mean, I get up. I don't. I don't walk around on all fours. I get up. I, I walk. You know, and, and, and you got the pictures too. 
Y- yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're they pretty hot. Right. I got to tell you, they're pretty hot pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me miss my days when I was 30 years old. (laughs) It kind of goes back to the fact that do they need to do that? Is there uh, is there some something in their environment that is forcing them to do that? And I think that is where environmental pressures come into play on the development of man into what he is today uh, a long time ago not anything recent but i'm talking about a long time ago geez guys the the, and guess what the climate on earth has been changing forever so um with that said we'll probably get some uh anyway um moving right along but there's got to be some sort of stimulus a catalyst that causes them to find a need to get up and walk Versus doing the, the knuckle walk that they do. Quadrupedal, the way they are built, the quadrupedal walk is far more, uh, it's easier for them. I guess is the simplest way to put it. It's easier for them. They're built for quadrupedal travel, not bipedal travel. Okay, okay. Let me, let me ask you this. Now, could a gorilla travel as far as people have reported Sasquatches traveling in a day, no. walking quadrupedally. No. no. Oh, quadrupedally, yes, but not bipedally. They they can travel, you know, dozens of miles on all fours because um, that's, I mean, I've, I've, I've heard reports and I believe one of the reports was from Washington State about someone encountering one that had a unique feature. And the same creature was reported 120 miles away the next day. And well, it had the same distinct feature. And uh, the chimpanzees are not going to travel those distances because they have no need to. They will travel so you, and uh, they migrate. Uh, you know, to areas for uh, food access, but they're not going to travel any great distance overnight like that. No. So would you agree that it's possible that that Sasquatch developed bipedalism in order to cover great distances and forage and do what he has to do and everything? I could only surmise that that would be a, a reason why that they did that because none of us knows. Guys, I hate to say it, but we're we're out of time. Oh mm. man, we'll have it was to just get good. We'll, we'll have to pick, <laughs> we'll, have, we'll have to pick it up next time, guys. <laughs> I was almost ready to take y'all some pictures. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> With that, we'll uh, we'll pick up pick it up again next week, folks. Thanks for sitting in. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open now.